today's lecture, I will give you an overview of the topics and ideas covered uh, in the module itself. right? And this module was concerned with the development of capitalism uh, seen in a, within a historical perspective. And what we did was to identify at different periods in history structural changes that were taking place within the system and the associated forms that capitalism took uh, and its implications for economy and society and indeed culture which we will go, the latter part of culture we will go into in greater detail in the next module. So to, uh, to start with uh, an overview of this particular module on the history of the development of capitalism, I would like you to have a look at this table. This table shows you the distribution of world income at three different points in time between two sets of countries. The countries are that the advanced capitalist industrial countries and the countries of the third world or the underdeveloped countries. And what comes out from the figures in this table is that until as late as 1850, the share of world income accruing to what later were considered to be underdeveloped countries, the share of world income accruing to third world countries, even in, 19, in 1850, was 65 percent of world income, while the share of world income accruing to capitalist industrial countries, the advanced industrial countries, uh, was much less at 35 percent. But within less than a century, by 1938, the tables had turned as between two group of these two groups of countries. The share of world income that now went to the advanced industrial countries was 76 percent, while the share of third world countries fell to only 24 percent. Now, this in my view represents the most dramatic change in the relative economic fortunes of two groups of countries in the world. And the question that we will raise initially in this lecture is what was the nature of that dynamism uh, which imparted to the industrializing countries this capacity to sharply increase their share of world income. And what was it in the relationship between these industrializing countries and the third world that pushed back the third world from a position of relative affluence to a position of poverty in less than a century. Okay, so we will have to go to the late 18th century to begin this part of the story. In the late, by the late 18th century, two new social classes emerged which were not there before in earlier times. One was the emergence of an industrial capitalist class that was producing for profit. And the second was the emergence of a working class or laboring class which earned, began to earn its livelihood uh, through wage labor. Now here are these, these capitalists who got a certain amount of capital to begin with. How they got it is another story. But they began with a certain amount of capital which they invested. Um, on the and hired labor and bought raw materials in machines uh, in order to be able to enlarge the amount of capital that they had begun with. In other words, 
they were hiring wage labor to generate profits. Now this process of, as we've called it, capital accumulation, this profit of, this process of increasing profits and expanding production uh, was taking place within a highly competitive environment. So in the capitalist countries, institutions, rules, laws, norms had been created on the basis of which uh, competition was possible and where there was private ownership of the means of production. So if you earned profit, uh, you could keep it after paying taxes. And if you bought machines, you could keep it. Uh, keep those machines. Now, so we have a process of um, producing for profit on the basis of hired labor within a competitive environment. Now this competitive environment is important because it created that pressure on the capitalist not only to generate profits but to reinvest those profits back into expanded production. The imperative of survival in a sense involved expanding output, expanding profits. And to be able to do that, you have to reinvest your capital back into production. It's not as if you earned a certain amount of profit and then went to the south of France and had a great time and uh, came back without any, you spending all your profits there. Uh, so within this new social and economic structure, you have for the first time production taking place for profit and the profit being constantly reinvested back into production. And as a consequence, there was a tendency for the continuous increase in the volume and range of products in the system. Now, another interesting aspect of reinvestment, one aspect of reinvestment we, we just discussed, which is that it enables expansion of production and you're able to earn more profit. But another aspect of this reinvestment was that it, it didn't involve simply remaining with the same technologies that were there before. Reinvestment involved also increasing productivity of the labor by introducing new technologies. And so reinvestment for the first time in history involved the mobilization of knowledge for the purpose of generating more profits, for the purpose of technological change, to increase productivity. So even knowledge began to be harnessed in the service of capital, if you like, largely. Uh, there, were, of course, was philosophical reasoning and, uh, um, you know, uh, knowledge for its own sake and so on, but by and large, um, an institutional structure emerged whereby capitalists began to mobilize knowledge in the service of increasing productivity and uh, profits. Now the, in the late 18th century, this process that I've just identified, this was the period of the Industrial Revolution that, that I've just identified, in all the, as I said, the continuous expansion in the process of investment, technical change and trade, and this led to the emergence of a globalized economy. Uh, this uh, process of investment and, and uh, expansion of production gradually began to encompass a large part of the world outside Britain and in fact outside Europe. And so capitalism became a, a global uh, enterprise, if you like, economy. The expansion beyond the boundaries of Europe of capitalism at that time 
involved the pursuit of two things which were necessary for that expansion on a global scale. One was exclusive access over industrial raw materials and two was access over the markets for their finished goods. So as capitalism expanded beyond Europe and encompassed many of the countries of Asia, Africa and Latin America, these countries were, were made to establish a new kind of relationship, economic and social and political relationship with the countries of Europe. And that relationship was called, is called colonialism, where each of the industrializing countries, major industrializing countries, was building an, a colonial empire. And uh, so between 1876 and 1915, about one quarter of the globe's land surface was distributed in the form of colonies among half a dozen European states. So this was the new world that was emerging uh, as capitalism expanded. But within the structure of colonialism, a new kind of international division of labor and international specialization of production began. You talk about specialization, Ms. Uh, Sundiar. Now here's another kind of specialization. Uh, you talk about specialization taking place at the micro level within one particular country, but imagine that specialization taking place on a global scale. Uh, this uh, specialization at the global level involved a restructuring of the economies of what later came to be called the third world, a restructuring of the uh, economies of the, of the colonies. It was a particular kind of restructuring. It involved through administrative intervention, through colonial policy, it involved um, converting economies, many of which were actually producing finished goods. They were producing manufactured goods, but on the base of handicrafts and exporting these finished goods all over the world. Um, but the colonial intervention involved converting these previously exporters of finished goods into exporters into specialists and exporters of industrial raw materials to Europe, which were then used by Europe or processed in Europe to produce manufactured goods at this, at this time through um, factories, the new industries, and then export these finished goods, these, these, these new manufactured goods back to the colonies. So this is the kind of new relationship that emerged between these two groups of countries. Now, as far as explaining the, this dramatic change in relative economic fortune is concerned, the key thing to understand here is that this colonial relationship, this restructuring of the economies of the colonies and their conversion into specialists in the, in the production and export of industrial raw materials and importers of finished goods from Europe, that resulted in a phenomenon whereby the surpluses that were produced in the third world countries were actually being systematically transferred through the market system to Europe. because the prices of industrial raw materials relative to the prices of finished goods were low. And over time, uh, th this ratio between the prices of uh, finished goods of Europe and industrial raw materials of uh, third world countries, this ratio kept on increasing. So this, this unequal kind of trade 
became the principal mechanism of resource transfer from third world countries to the countries of Europe. So while surpluses were produced, the institutional and economic conditions required to reinvest the surplus into industrial manufacturing and thereby achieve a kind of dynamism in the domestic economy, those conditions required for the reinvestment of the surplus within the, within the domestic economy were prevented from emerging in a systematic way as a, through policy. Okay. But this penetration of the economies of the colonies was not simply an economic penetration. It in fact reached into the very heart of these societies. Because being able to rule people and change their destinies for the worse through the kind of new economic mechanism that they had established was only possible by penetrating not just the economy but the very psyche of people. These uh, rich civilizations with highly dignified people of great talent and innovation capabilities were ruptured from their own history. They were separated from their own language. And in their psyche, they were induced to internalize the image of themselves that the settler had created, had constructed, that they were natives. So they began to see themselves as native and not a proud and independent people who were creative um, and, and, and uh, rich in terms of their ideas and civilization. So this dependency at the economic level was accompanied by creating a kind of psychic, psychological dependencies uh, amongst the people. Amos Cesar has put it very well. He says, I'm talking of millions of men who have been skillfully injected with fear, inferiority complexes, trepidation, servility, despair, abasement, unquote. As I said, at the economic level, colonial penetration involved a restructuring of these economies, their conversion from exporters of finished goods to specialist exporters of industrial raw materials. And therefore, they were began to get integrated into a new kind of global economy, where one set of countries was producing raw materials, another set of countries was engaged in a dynamic industrialization process, where it was processing these raw materials, converting them into finished goods and factories, and sending them back to the third world uh, and their markets. So this was a kind of development of underdevelopment in the third world countries. We, as we've seen from the data, from the information that uh, we discussed in these earlier lectures, um, capitalism at the global level brought development to the industrializing countries and underdevelopment to the colonies, to the third world. So development and underdevelopment are two aspects of the same phenomenon, the phenomenon of capitalist development, where capitalism is seen in terms of a global economy. Some of the instruments through which this restructuring of the economies of the third world were conducted, were, 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 was conducted, uh, I'll discuss very briefly because we're short of time uh, in this lecture. For example, in order to convert countries like India into specialists in the production and export of industrial raw materials, they had to first employ administrative actions, economic policies through which they could eliminate 
their handicraft, their manufacturing capability, which was handicraft primarily, uh, uh, manufacturing capability, production of finished goods in urban areas, they, were, they had to eliminate that uh, and uh, replace it by reorienting agriculture for the production of what you call, they called cash crops, industrial raw materials like uh, tobacco and um, uh, cotton and jute and so on. This uh, involved, for example, in terms of the economic uh, interventions, uh, placing import duties on Indian manufactured goods being imported into Britain or Europe. India, as late as the 19th century, had a cost advantage, Indian textiles had a cost advantage over British textiles of 60%. So Indian cotton textiles were 60% cheaper than British textiles being produced in the, around the middle of the 19th century. And they also had better quality. So what the British did was that they placed an import duty of 80% on Indian textiles entering into Britain. That meant that they were able to deprive Indian textile manufacturers and other manufacturers of a market in, in Britain. They also began to de deny them a, 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 their market in the domestic economy, which was under colonial control. And that was done by a whole range of measures, one of which I will mention. And that was that when British goods entered the ports of, let's say, Calcutta or Bombay or Karachi and were transported inland, there were no toll taxes at the district level or state level. They were able to go right through the Indian subcontinent up to Peshawar. But in the case of Indian manufactured goods that were being produced in, let's say, Bengal, when they were transported westwards inland, they were told taxes at every district. So that by the time Indian textiles or other goods reached the northern areas of uh, what is Pakistan today, um, their prices were much higher than the prices of British goods. So both the external market and the domestic market for finished goods was uh, deprived, was uh, eliminated as far as domestic manufacturers was concerned, Indian manufacturers. Um, other measures included, uh, this is uh, Shashi Tharoor has uh, provided the evidence for this, uh, involved the cutting off of the thumbs of Indian weavers. Uh, because, you know, as, as I mentioned, this was handicraft production and hands and, and, and thumbs were very important in, in the production process. Uh, those thumbs were removed, cut, cut off. So this was a physical uh, violation, physical violence on, on people to be able to stop them from producing goods that could compete with Britain, both externally and domestically. Through these and other measures, between 1815 and 1850, British cotton goods conquered India. That country absorbed in 1850 as much as 25 percent of all of Lancashire's exports. By, the, by 1850, uh, Lancashire in England the, the textile mills there uh, were, uh, were producing and exporting textiles. While India, ironically, by that time, had, was importing these factory product produced textiles from England to India. And the view that Shashi Tharoor is giving, the estimate that he is giving is that India alone 
was importing 25% of all of Lancashire's textile products. But during the same period, as I said, the Indian craftsmen were defeated through both economic as well as administrative as well as physical methods. Uh, was defeated in the competitive struggle and these weavers found they no more had a place for themselves in industry. There are reports of the colonial administration which indicate that Dhaka, which was once a flourishing center of uh, textiles manufacturers, as a result of this restructuring of the economy, uh, Dhaka was deserted. I mean, it's, there was a sharp reduction in the total population of Dhaka and uh, a flourishing manufacturing center was converted, had, had, had become a jungle where wild beasts were roaming. So it's interesting that in a period when there was industrialization and urbanization taking place in Britain and other countries of Europe, a de-industrialization and a de-urbanization was taking place in countries like India and other countries of the third world. By the end of the Second World War, now we're going up sort of fast forward. During the industrialization pe period, the industrial revolution period in Europe, the typical production unit in the 19th, 18th, 19th centuries was a small firm as I said, which was placed in a competitive environment. This competition meant that those companies that couldn't compete with the more efficient companies uh, stopped expanding and were knocked out of the system. And the smaller companies began to buy the larger, the, the larger companies began to buy the smaller companies. And gradually the typical production unit changed from the small firm to the large national corporation initially. And I've discussed the implications of, of, of that um, in terms of global politics, power politics, because the large national corporation meant that each of the European countries began to compete with, with the other, other countries. Uh, to get exclusive access over industrial raw materials and over markets for their finished goods. And this competition between states, which were pursuing the interests of the large national corporations, this competitive struggle ultimately ended up, actually, was one of the key economic factors underlying the First World War. Right. Of course, the problem couldn't be solved, and the Treaty of Versailles uh, didn't really resolve the conflict between the rising industrial power of Germany and the rest of Europe and uh, it resulted in the Second World War. But after the Second World War there was another structural change in, in the economy and that was that the large national corporation gave way to the large multinational corporation. Now the point about the multinational corporation which we've discussed at some length but the key point from the point of view of this particular lecture is that the multinational character of these new corporations imparted them with a far greater capacity to earn profits than the earlier production units could, whether small or the, the, or the large national firms. Because these large multinational corporations were able to buy the cheapest raw material from wherever it was available. Uh, they were able to fabricate different parts of the uh, uh, product for developing new technologies in-house from all over the world. 
So their capacity to produce profits, in fact, increased. At a certain point, the new world economy, characterized by these large multinational corporations, found itself with the problem of growth and investment. Because the capacity to produce output began to outstrip the capacity to consume output, simply, which we've discussed in some, in some detail. And so the corporate enterprises, the multinational firms, they may have been competing with each other, but each firm had, was a kind of price maker. It was large enough to be able to influence price of its products. And it was large enough to be able to do so by adjusting its production levels, supplies. And so these large corporations began to understand that because of this problem of consumption demand, if they were actually to produce products and further expand the production capacity, they would have to reduce their prices at that time. And their profit margins would have to be reduced. So rather than to face declining profits or unsold stocks, they simply reduced investment initially. And then they began to put this, these profits not into industry, but into banks. And expected banks to give them a return on the deposits they had made. So finding expanded production not a very profitable enterprise, or not at least, I mean, growth in production capacity uh, was in a, in a sense restricted to some extent. And instead, the profits they had earned from manufacturing started flowing into banks. And banks were then obliged to lend that money, those deposits in turn, and earn a, an interest, which they then shared with the depositors, the, the large multinational corporations. Thus began the rapid expansion of the financial sphere of the world economy. Have a look at this table. Now, this is the last table I'm going to present you, so don't worry. Just, just focus on the, on the data. I'll just uh, I'll guide you through it. In 1964, international trade in goods and services, as you will note, was $188 billion while international banking was only $20 billion. So this financial sphere was a much smaller than the sphere of the real economy where production of goods and services was taking place. But notice that by 1983, the composition of world GDP had changed and the weight of the financial sphere by this time, by 1983, had become bigger than the size of the real economy, where goods and services were being produced. Uh, by 1983, $2,253 billion worth of international banking compared to 1,986 in terms of the value of goods and services in the real economy. So there was a change, in a sense, in the relative position of the real economy vis-a-vis -vis the financial. The financial economy, for the first time, became bigger. But within the next two centuries or more, this gap 
between the size of the financial sphere and the size of the real economy, this gap exploded. Notice that by 2013, the value of international banking was more than five times the value of goods and services produced in the real economy. So in other words, here you have a new kind of economic structure. Yet again, a new kind of economic structure where you have this huge balloon of finance sitting on top of a relatively small real economy. Now the nature of finance, of, of the financial sphere, as we'll just discuss, is that it's fragile. So this large balloon on sitting on top of the real economy imparted to the whole economy uh, a certain kind of fragility. Because if the balloon exploded, if somebody uh, put a pin in, into it, some any exogenous factor, any loss of confidence, uh, and it exploded the financial sphere, it would take the real economy down with it. Because if, if banks collapsed, which were conducting the production and sale of financial goods and services, uh, if, if banks collapsed, uh, then their ability to lend to the real economy in terms of working capital for purchase and for purchase of machinery and so on, the, though that lending would stop too. And so the real economy would also go down along with the financial sphere. And so this, the acute fragility of the financial sphere actually imparted a fragility to the overall world economy by this time. Now, what are, broadly speaking, what are the three fundamental features of the financial sphere which impart this fragility to it? The first is that in the purchase of financial products, production and sale of financial products, prices of these products are based on estimates of risk in the purchase of these products. An estimate of risk is based on probability calculations. The higher the risk, the lower the, 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 the higher the risk, the larger the return to the investor has to be for him to invest. And the lower the risk, the lower the return he'll be happy with uh, as a result of his investment in the, in the financial sphere. Now the problem with probability estimates it's, is that it is essentially based on the assumption that averages of the past hold into the future. This is a kind of, they imagine a kind of non-stochastic world, right? that the averages of the past hold into the future. But if we th think of the world in, as it actually is, it's a real world, thing is unexpected ha things can happen in the future. The future is not necessarily, ne necessarily an, expansion, uh, uh, an extension of the past. Unexpected events can occur. And these unexpected events, if they do occur, which they sometimes do, then all your probability estimates will go out of the window. They'll be overturned. Right? And that is what is one of the factors that gives fragility to this kind of economy. An economy dominated by the financial sphere. The second aspect that gives fragility to the financial sphere is that there's an asymmetry of information between the seller of a financial product and the buyer of a financial product. You know, it's like somebody who's selling a second-hand car has more information about that car, about its weaknesses and so on, compared to the buyer. So this 
asymmetry of information meant that many of the buyers of these financial products were taking undue risks. They were, they were buying products which were actually riskier than they imagined. Because they didn't have the same information as the, as the information which was obtained, which was available to the producer of those financial products, whether they were bonds or derivatives or subprime mortgages or whatever. Right. The third element in this fragility was that these financial products, which I mentioned, of which I mentioned a few, you know, these subprime mortgages and uh, derivatives like debt bonds and risk insurance. While these products appeared individually distinct, were actually interlinked at the macro level. And this interlinkage between the various financial products and involved therefore certain macroeconomic consequences for the uh, following from the actions of individual buyers. Now the point is that at best the finance company or the bank could estimate the risk at the micro level, at the individual level, and therefore prices products in the way that I've just mentioned. But they couldn't estimate the systemic risk of buying or selling these financial products, the macroeconomic risk. Now, of course, they, they didn't have the training, the individual bankers who, you know, were, who were churning out these financial products you know, every month. Uh, were sort of young graduates who had uh, acquired a diploma in, uh, the, you know, the certified financial analysts. And based on the limited training that they had, they could produce financial products through simple probability estimates. But they didn't have the skills to estimate the macroeconomic risk, the risk in the system as a whole. Uh, that could be done by universities and researchers at universities. But even researchers at universities discovered that building macroeconomic models or macro models of finance and estimating a macro systemic risk had to assume that the distribution of individual risk remains constant. But actually, distribution of individual risk changes. And so if it does, as it did, means that you can't really estimate systemic risk. So they didn't have the mathematics even, as Professor Spence has pointed out. They didn't have the maths to estimate systemic risk, let alone trying to estimate it by the, by the individual bankers. And so these three elements, these three features of, shall we say, imperfect information, which existed at both the micro and macro levels, gave to the global economy, global financial economy, the potential for market failure. And particularly so, uh, within an institutional framework a regulatory framework that was inadequate. Even the Glass-Seagull Act of the 1990s, which has been there since the Great Recession of the 1930s, the Glass-Seagull Act, which actually restricted banks from taking undue risks, investing in unduly risky products and unduly risky investment activity, that those, the Glass-Seagull Act was actually abrogated, repealed under the Clinton administration on the advice of these economists who believed in the efficacy of the market system. 
they they believe that the the financial system the financial markets were actually fun, uh, uh, self regulatory and they should not be regulated uh, by governments there should be no government intervention let the market be free that was a kind of ideology um, and clinton fell for it and removed the glass seagull act and uh, that created set the stage for this rapid growth in the financial sphere because you know the reserve ratios of banks were changed and uh, they were allowed to engage in a whole range of activities in the profit uh, seeking uh, aim uh, that was actually highly risky and i just as i've just pointed out um, any of these micro as well as macro risks could not or were not being estimated and the result was that a large number of investors including companies and banks were taking much bigger risks than they imagined now these banks by the end of the 20th and the early 21st century had become highly leveraged first of all they had become highly leveraged that is to say their exposure relative to the assets became very high but the second was that many of their assets were highly toxic and they either deliberately kept it a secret or didn't know about it toxic asset means you see each time a bank lends to somebody an individual or a company that lending generates an interest rate certain amount of interest and that interest is a kind of income so the bank is getting an income from lending so lending becomes an asset right so if you look at the balance sheet of a bank the the money that they have lent to various people turns up in the asset part of the balance sheet you you agree na okay now the point i'm making was that first of all the ratio between the exposure of the banks and the actual assets that they had was uh, was was very high that's what's meant by highly leveraged but the other thing that happened was that the assets themselves were actually had become highly toxic but toxic it means highly risky lendings and they would become risky because you lend you doing subprime mortgages right and you you know you you having all kinds of derivatives uh, whose risk is a little uncertain to estimate right um and so this fact exposed all the major financial organizations in the world to extreme financial distress all of them to the extent that they'd been trying to earn profits through lending to all kinds of people and producing all kinds of financial products all of them had become very vulnerable and the world's economy was waiting for a time bomb because you see this financial sphere that i just talked about the balloon sitting on top of the real economy is entirely based on the confidence of investors confidence about the future so long as everybody is expecting more profits in the future rising prices of financial assets uh the system will grow rapidly the financial sphere will grow rapidly but any loss of confidence for whatever reason can suddenly cause a chain reaction that causes a financial collapse of the banks and of the whole financial system that's what i meant by being a time bomb if you know every major financial entity has toxic assets and is highly levered within us an, an environment of imperfect information 
where the future is not necessarily based on past averages, certain th unknown, unexpected events can occur, such as a loss of confidence. It could be a time bomb, it could explode it's like a chain reaction. Well, the bomb did explode in the year 2008. And then some of the most important banks and finance companies suffered simultaneous and major damage which brought the financial and economic system of the world into the most serious crisis in a century. I'll end there with a quotation from the statement of Ben Bernanke who was sitting behind a, com a computer, he was chairman of the US Federal Reserve and watching the time bomb explode. Here is his quote. On Thursday, 18th September 2008, at 11 a.m., the Federal Reserve noticed a tremendous drawdown of money market accounts in the U.S. Money to the tune of $550 billion was being drawn out in the matter of an hour, hour or two. The Treasury, in response, opened up its window to help and pumped $105 billion in the system. That was to restore confidence. Obviously, you know when there's a run on the banks, it's because of some fear, some loss of confidence. So to reestablish that confidence, you know, they, uh, to, to fill a kind of, to fill the hole in the dike, they put in uh, what they thought was an adequate amount of money, uh, $105 billion into the system. But quickly realized that they could not stem the tide. As you said, we were having an electronic run on the banks. That, so they decided to close the operation, close down the money accounts and announce a guarantee of $250,000 per account so that they would be, there would not be any further panic. If they had not done that, that is to say not given a guarantee of we basically said every depositor, whatever the amount of money he or she might have deposited and which they're afraid will get uh, blown away, the, the Federal Reserve is guaranteeing that you will get up to $250,000, whatever else happens to the bank. Right? So they thought that that would restore confidence. If they had not done that, their estimation is that by 2 p.m. that afternoon, $5.5 trillion would have been drawn out of the country's money market system. This would have collapsed the entire U.S. economy and within 24 hours, the world economy would have collapsed. He ends by saying it would have been the end of our economic system and our political system as we know it." Unquote. So here you have a ringside seat, so to speak, you know, a first-hand account of the actual minutes and hours during which that time bomb was exploding. Mervyn King, who was a brilliant governor of the Bank of England at that time, had played a major role uh, in uh, stemming that tide once it acquired, went beyond the boundaries of the U.S. And as I said, you know, these, these money markets and financial systems and capital markets are highly integrated globally. So when, when the crisis began to occur in the U.S., Mervyn King quickly sussed out it would happen in England too. And so he took, hard, you know, quick measures to prevent a, a, a disaster from taking place uh, in England. Uh, he says, quote, not since the beginning of the First World War has our banking system been so close to collapse, unquote. So here the story ends for the moment. 
and what we've argued is that if you look at the history of the of the world economy three kinds of things are happening in it in the in the in the process of its growth in the structure and dynamics of the system the first is that as it expands even in terms of the real economy and becomes a global economy it creates affluence for some countries development for some countries and under development for some other countries so that's one feature of what of the story i've just told you and these this process of development and under development has profound implications for human society and for human welfare imagine the condition of people in the third world when it happened millions of people died in the famine in india just in one famine in the deccan famine a famine that could have been avoided look at the impoverishment that occurred as a result of uh, the indian uh, manufacturing and the handicraft industry being destroyed so that's the first aspect of the process of growth this is a structural feature it establishes relationships between countries that are of an unequal nature development to some under development to other countries the second feature that we noticed is that structural changes actually occur over time in through the change precisely through the process of competition the size of the typical production unit changed from the small firm of the 18th and early 19th centuries to the large multinational corporations in the late 20th century and today and this change in the tip size of the typical production unit again has profound political economic and social consequences that we have discussed but there is a third tendency actually in the coming lectures when we are discussing how multinationals in the in in their effort to sell products actually are contributing to a change in culture the emergence of the consumerist psyche and a completely new relationship emerged between human beings and human beings between humans and commodities and between humans and nature uh but that we'll discuss in the le next lecture so the impact of multinational corporations as a typical production unit uh is not just economic but also social uh, uh, also political and also social at the level of the human culture psyche which of course we'll discuss later the third feature of the structure and dynamics of the system is that at a certain point in time in the development of that system the financial sphere began to dominate the real economy and that gave a kind of fragility to the system which made it vulnerable to crises of, of a repeated nature uh john eatwell has estimated that there is a global crisis every 10 years in this system on average there was a global crisis in 1873 in the late 19th century again another one in the 1930s and now a third one whose nature the time period for which it will last the depth to which it will the depths of the crisis that it will reach modern economics this neoclassical economics doesn't have the capability to understand that so th this third kind of this big crisis that is now occurring is not just a crisis in the economy and society but it's also a crisis in the subject of economics we've got to rethink economics i'll end on that uncomfortable note thank you